Today's guest is Esther Blum. Esther is the best-selling author of Cave Women Don't Get Fat, Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous, Secrets of Gorgeous, and the Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous Project. Um, her latest book is called See You Later, Ovulator. So we're talking all about menopause today. Um, she has a very busy virtual practice where she helps women balance hormones, lose stubborn body fat, and treat the root cause of health struggles. She has a Bachelor of Science in Clinical Nutrition and is a graduate of New York University where she received her Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition. Um, she is a certified dietitian, certified nutrition specialist. She's got so many, I can't even list them all here. She is amazing. She's been doing this for a while um, and a best-selling author. So make sure you check the links um, in the show notes for her books. Uh, we'll make sure we put see you, uh, see you later, ovulator, mastering menopause with nutrition, hormones, and self-advocacy. Um, we get all into, all, I got all the questions. She has so much amazing info in this episode. So um, we'll go ahead and dive right in. Here is Esther Blum. Okay. So Esther, menopause, perimenopause, getting ready for menopause, post-menopause. <laughs> Holy crap. It's probably <laughs> one of the most like confusing poor women. Like who do I trust? Everyone has a different opinion. What is going on with me? You Google something, you get 50 million different ideas. Can you talk about why you've decided to take this by the horns for women? <laughs> I did. I, I really did. And, um, you know, I, I decided to do it because a, I'm, I myself, I'm going through it. I'm 52 and, you know, man, uh, when my estrogen drops, I start hot flashing like crazy and feel, you know, terrible and exhausted all the time. Um, and number two is, you know, I'm treating clients every day. I've been treating clients with menopause since, you know, my late twenties and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just hearing the outrageously egregious stories about the medical gaslighting that's going on I when know. doctors, I mean, it's ridiculous ridiculous and and celebrities it doesn't matter if you're a celebrity or a lay person where they're just doctors are not teaching menopause in medical school even though every single woman goes through it i'm like oh mm -hmm. dear lord so mm -hmm. you know and i always say menopause it's not a birth control deficiency it's not an antidepressant <laughs> deficiency right it's a <laughs> hormone deficiency so why are we not replenishing hormones and the thing that made me the angriest and was like, all right, the final straw of like, I'm going to write the book is just, you know, I do a ton of research and reading the research and just the benefits of hormones on a woman's body and the prevention of chronic degenerative diseases. Like the fact that women do not have access to this is crazy, mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm like how, 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 because it is published research. So doctors should be yeah. boning up on this stuff. I know it's hard to not feel like they don't care, you know, like it, it, the general energy that I feel like a lot of women me get met up with is like sucks to suck. Yeah. Like, it's like, I don't want to touch any of that. I don't really know what's going on with you. And I kind of do. And I don't, I don't know, like it's this very dismissive energy. And so the women are showing up like you and, you know, we talked about Dr. Minnie Pels, who you're familiar with. It's just like the women are showing up like, oh, okay. Uh, well, we would like to not feel like crap and have our bones degenerate and feel like we're crazy and like, okay, we'll do it. So women are showing up and I appreciate you doing that. And I wanted to talk about like, obviously you have, I want to hit on your book, cave women don't get fat. Right. So, sure. but also see you later ovulator, but in kind of staying on this topic, what are some of the biggest things that women like health issues that they should be considering as they're approaching menopause that may make that, uh, easier or more difficult experience for them? Well, first of all, you know, women at this age in perimenopause and menopause are at the greatest risk for losing muscle mass. And we lose the most muscle mass during this time in our life, unless we have a chronic illness. But mm -hmm. aside from that, you know, as hormones decline, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, as the ovaries begin to wind down their production, we naturally lose muscle mass if we are not eating optimal dietary protein and doing strength training. So like mm -hmm. just changing your diet and adding in two strength training sessions a week can do wonders for offsetting weight gain, fatigue, insomnia, mm -hmm. and most importantly, muscle loss. And why is muscle loss so important? Because 
over the age of 65, falls and fractures are the leading cause of death. And yeah. when we lose that muscle, you know, you increase your risk for falls and fractures, decrease mobility. So it's super duper important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's music to my ears. And I think a lot of women, like I'm 40 right now. And I think a lot of women, you just think, well, it's not going to happen to me. You just, it's like, it's this very, but I, I watched, you know, I watched my mom who at one point was competing in the Olympic trials for track to going through getting type two diabetes, um, mm -hmm. getting osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, dragging her foot when she walked, then, you know, having a stroke now has mm -hmm. Alzheimer's like this. It's, it's hard to watch, but it's like, I remember my mom being my age and just do, do, do going about life, whatever. And it's like, if you're not, you know, no, you know, obviously no shame on my mom. She didn't know. She had literally no idea. She just, that, that time period, it was just like, oh yeah, you just go to Burger King. Like, I don't know. Like she just wasn't thinking about it, you know, yeah. but I've seen what happens and they didn't have gyms. Like our parents didn't have like a gym. It was like, what? I mean, maybe you could go to the YMCA or something and see if you're allowed to, it just wasn't even a thing, you know? So we are in a position in which we are like the best poised to be able to go through menopause in a healthy way. So we've got strength training, eating adequate protein. What else should women be considering either before, during, or after menopause in terms of like health biomarkers? Uh, okay. This is to me, like some of the most important conversations I have with women is around saying no and really practicing mm. self-care. So self-care yeah. has many different pillars, but you know, as you become older, here's the gift of aging is as you become older, your ability to tolerate what you used to tolerate really goes down. Women yeah. actually become more introverted during menopause, which I was mm. like, oh, I thought it was just the pandemic and being really highly selective with who you're spending time with, where you're spending your time and energy, how to streamline processes, right? Mm. How to hire help if you can. Um, and just really rethink your priorities, mm -hmm. right? And and how to simplify. We don't actually need more in our life. We actually yeah. need less. Mm -hmm. So saying no more, um, being very protective of your time. And the time you should be the most protective of, in my opinion, is your evening routine and your sleep hygiene, okay? Yeah. We are all on our phones. We're supercharged. We're, you know, texting our friends and we're watching Netflix and scrolling the gram and all these things. I'm not going to say I never do those things either. I'm I'm not going to lie. But getting your phone on silent mode, you know, past 7 p.m., doing some meditation before bed. And mm -hmm. everyone says, I I know I suck at meditating. You don't have to move to an ashram. Like there's no, you know, trophy that goes out to people who are quote unquote good at meditating. If you can breathe, if you've ever like driven somewhere and got there and not remember driving there, you've actually been in a meditative state. Those are just their alpha waves giving your brain a nice mm -hmm. calm break, right? Or been in the shower when ideas like magically come to you. That's a meditative state. So mm -hmm. it's really just breathing and consciously setting your intent for mm -hmm. what you want your life to look like, your health to look like. So carving aside 10 minutes a day to breathe deep, deeply breathe, lower your cortisol and mm -hmm. just like, unwind, pull out the yeah. stimulation and like shut down. Yeah. I love that. That's your advice because as our adrenals become more taxed, as we go through this stage, like that's a learned skill, what you're talking about. It's something that that was probably my biggest. No, it wasn't. It was, it was my biggest, um, I'd say accomplishment, if you will, for lack of a better word in 2022 was really training myself how to let go of a day you know, starting around three, four, I just learned how to come down and have, you know, right now I have a new, I'm playing with my evening routine. I, I feel this so much. So I'm doing like a cold plunge and then an infrared sauna with these little nice. brain tap heads. I'm just like having fun being kind of biohacky with it and then meditating afterwards. And it's like, I've just been crawling in my bed at like eight 30, like, <laughs> oh, yay, you know, and it, it has been a learned skill. Cause I used to be the, I'm going to write a program at 1130 PM. Like, yeah, I'm crushing life. I'm grinding baby. I'm, you know, and it's, like, I've had to retrain myself like a baby, you know? And so I love that yeah. that's your advice because that when you don't have all of your, I guess, for lack of a better word, your organs performing at the full tilt level that they used to mm -hmm. your every, your stress 
load is lower. You know what I mean? And, and so I love that. That's the advice that you give is like, learn how to be calm and say no. Yeah. Yes. And your, your resiliency is lower when your hormones yeah. decline. I mean, think of how you think of if you're someone who ever gets the period flu, right. Where like the mm-hmm. week before your period, your immune system's low and you're dragging your wagon. Like now it's your body's way of saying, honey, you're writing checks. You cannot cash. Like you've really got to focus on your energy management, not mm-hmm. only your time management, but your energy management. So, so that's something great. And along mm-hmm. those lines too, <clears throat> when it comes to your evening routine, it's also a really important time to check in with your alcohol and caffeine habit because, yeah. um, again, your body becomes less um, able to detoxify mm-hmm. caffeine. And if you're someone who's sensitive already, like it's time to really look at some adaptogens yeah. in re- in terms of replacing coffee. Uh, I like to drink. It's non-caffeinated. It's like cacao and cordyceps. Maybe nice. it has five milligrams of caffeine, but it's like a yeah. four sigmatic perform is a good one, you know, but mm-hmm. there's a mud water is another one. Right. There's all sorts of adaptogenic drinks. Right. That's really great. And then alcohol. I mean, wow, this was another good come to Jesus for me because my original books were like on hangover recovery and, mm. you know, <laughs> like yeah. partying and balancing out yeah. the martinis with the wheatgrass. But, you know, again, <laughs> as we age, you have to be more judicious because here's the dirty secret about alcohol is that every cocktail you have or glass of wine, it raises your circulating estrogen levels for four to six hours after you drink them. So most women going into perimenopause or even the PMS phase, right? Your progesterone is really, really low. You're Mm -hmm. relatively estrogen dominant. As you go into in particular perimenopause, what a lot of women get uh, you know, these really heavy periods as a result, these clots and these cramps and swollen breasts, tender breasts, irritability, feeling very emotional and raw. And so wine is only going to exacerbate that situation. It's only going to keep you in that estrogen dominant state. Mm. And once you start, replen- if you start replenishing with bioidentical hormones, you know, again, it's alcohol really does not do your hormones or your thyroid or your body composition or your sleep justice. So be yeah. judicious. I'm not telling you to never have a drink, right. but be conscious of it. Don't certainly, if you're like having it every night, you, you do have to cut back if you're going to conquer, you know, the yeah. symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, because both caffeine and alcohol are going to trigger hot flashes. They're going to disrupt your sleep. And it's, it's a real storm. I love those insights. I think a lot of women, have been running off of adrenaline and cortisol for so long that the, the thought of losing that is scary. You know, it's scary for a lot of women and what any of us who have reduced, you know, I almost mm-hmm. never drink. Cause I just, I just don't like it. I just don't like, I don't enjoy the experience of it or after like, it's just, there's not a, but caffeine definitely more of my, my, my type of vice, but I've learned as I've reduced that pretty dramatically for myself that I'm actually I'm way more judicious with what I do than just being busy and going and achieving, you know, it's like, I actually accomplish more and it, gosh, it feels good in terms of, you know, heart rate variability and sleep quality. If you're having alcohol at night, it's like, you're ruining your body's ability to recover fully. So then you just keep going into every single day with less energy, you know, and not not to mention the impacts on your brain and your mental health as you age, like it's definitely something to look, look at and, I have found it. I'm sure you too. It's like (sighs) proactively learning other ways to manage stress, proactively doing some mindset work. So you're not taking things as personally, you're not putting all these burdens on yourself at work. You're not, you know, because then you don't need that relief as much, or maybe you learn to breathe or walk Mm -hmm. or meditate. Yeah. So I I would love that you're singling those two things out for perimenopausal women. Um, in terms of, I know you're big on, obviously, you know, you're an RD, you're an integrative dietitian. Um, what do you see in terms of gut health that women might want to be aware of in this demographic? So again, hormones do change your, not only your microbiome, but your estrobolome, which is the subset mm-hmm. of your microbiome, those billions of beneficial bacteria that are able to metabolize and detoxify estrogen in the gut. So mm-hmm. Um, I see high levels as an enzyme called beta glucuronidase that can be elevated when you are not clearing out estrogen. And this can happen in the liver and the gut. 
Um, but it really gives me a window into your phase three detoxification, but it can also be elevated with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so with the change in your, your microbiome, you can also see a decrease in the production of stomach acid. And when that happens, uh, bacterial overgrowth dysbiosis can start to manifest itself where you get an overgrowth of some really pro-inflammatory bacteria, some of which deliberately shut off your stomach's production of hydrochloric acid so that, you know, they can just set up home there and hang out mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that literally you have fire in your belly, that, that you check out, make sure you're digesting your food. If not, you get on some hydrochloric acid, you use some natural herbs to kill off mm -hmm. um, the bacterial overgrowth. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you repopulate your gut with the good guys because your uh, small intestine makes about 90 to 95% of the neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin in your brain. So inflamed gut, inflamed brain, and it will interfere with your emotional regulation. You can be more prone to panic attacks or anxiety or depression, especially mm -hmm. with the consequent decline in progesterone, right? It's kind of a one-two mm -hmm. punch there. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to be able to heal the inflammation in your gut, digest yeah. and absorb your food, and really help your brain fire in all cylinders. You clear out that brain fog you feel like emotionally regulated. And it's, yeah. it's a really important piece of the pie that often gets so overlooked yes. or not even tested at all. Yeah. I've begun doing stool analyses on my clients and I cannot even believe how many people are walking around with massive dysbiotic guts, SIBO, super high amounts of methane, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia production, like they're not digesting well. And I love that you mentioned, you know, some getting some betaine HCL is what I mm -hmm. start my clients on. Sometimes they can't, some I've had clients that can't even handle that. So we start with apple cider vinegar in the middle of meals. And then we work towards rebuilding stomach acid with betaine HCL. And it's, yeah, like it's crazy to me how many people are on antacids and PPIs. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, we have such low stomach acid and then we're going to lower. I won't, I won't get into that whole thing, but you want yeah. an acidic stomach. Like she said, you want an acidic environment mm -hmm. in your stomach so you can break down your food. Do you have anything and to also, add to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, also you want to support bone density. You can not on the PPIs and on, you know, the Pepsid and the Prilosec, you create this really alkaline environment, but you need acid to absorb your trace minerals like calcium mm -hmm. and magnesium and zinc mm -hmm. and boron and all the cofactors, vitamin K, all the cofactors you need for optimal bone density too. And so, um, that's a great you know, point. Yeah. Yeah. Often mm -hmm. the reflux and the reason why people are on PPIs is they have H pylori. And so, and that thrives in an uh, environment of low stomach acid. So once you kill yes. off the H pylori, then people usually tolerate the, um, the acid much better. And I have mm -hmm. to say the coolest story is like my client, Laura, cause she came to me like single girl in New York city. And, you know, she's like, my teenage son tells me my breath stinks and I want to date. And I just, I can't date in this condition, you know, it's terrible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we cleaned up her gut. We had to go through like two rounds of treatment to kill off the H pylori. But then by the end of our coaching, she had like fallen in love with this man who she knew mm. a long time and they were Aww. dating and happy and her gut was totally healed. Her hot flashes also resolved. She was a woman who didn't even want to use hor uh, bioidentical hormones, mm. even though she needed them. Yeah. So, but her hot flashes resolved, her sleep improved, her energy was better. So just starting with the right. gut it, right. and I, you know, can work wonders for hormone balance. And if you, mm -hmm. the, or I always say this, the better your gut is going into perimenopause or menopause, the better your transition will be. I love sure. that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you hit, you made such a great point. It's like, not only are you not able to make your neurotransmitters in your gut correctly for mood and emotional regulation, but you're also in this time where you have declining hormones. So it's like from a, from a neurotransmitter and hormonal standpoint, if you're having way less than you need, like you're gonna feel sad all the time, crying all the time, emotional, can't handle anything, you know? And so, yeah, the gut is so huge. And then the other thing let's hit on that bioidentical hormones you're talking about, because this is something that so many people have confusion on. They're like, is that good? Is that bad? 
Can you tell us your thought on biodynamical yes. hormones? So first of all, you know, um, Rachel Rubin is a wonderful GYN. She's one of many I collaborate with and follow, but on uh, Instagram, but she did a beautiful post recently on how every woman should be on bioidentical vaginal estrogen. Okay. Even if you have had cancer, if you have had a history of cancer, talk to your doctors about most mm. doctors are going to tell you it's perfectly safe. It is a mm. micro dose that stays in the vaginal canal. The, the studies, huh. and I have these studies in my book, see you later ovulator, but there is no difference in blood concentrations oh, of okay. estrogen in women who are using vaginal estrogen and women who aren't, but the women who are not using vaginal estrogen are far more prone to pelvic floor prolapse, bladder liquid leakage, UTIs, um, which are a drag to deal with when you've never mm -hmm. had them in your life. And all of a sudden you're like, mm -hmm. what the hell? So mm -hmm. you really want to make sure. And, and also like lubrication, because hello, yeah. uh, so many women, 90% uh, of the women I see that have just libidos in the tank. They're like, don't even come near me. They feel like they're dry and on fire. And, you know, right. there's just nothing going on there. It's real quiet. So you, and because there's also vaginal atrophy happening. So you yeah. want to make sure that you maintain the structural integrity of the vaginal mm. walls. And you do this with bioidentical estrogen. Mm, so that's step yeah. one. The delivery systems are very effective. Number two, bioidentical hormones are not implicated in the studies that show risks and correlations with cancer. The study, the women's that got off a women's health initiative study used, listen to the, how this study was designed, it took postmenopausal women who were 10 years out of menopause or 10 years from the beginning of their onset of menopause gave them Premarone, which is a uh, synthetic estrogen derived from the urine of pregnant horses, did not give them any opposing uh, progesterone or testosterone or DHEA, and then wow. declared, oh, hormones are dangerous. They're going to cause cancer and blood clots and stroke and heart and heart disease. And, so and they're going to kill you, right? They're going to kill you. So if you go to menopause.org, and again, I have this all in my book, if you go to menopause.org, you look at the two updated position papers from the North American Menopause Society, you will see that the data was interpreted in that Women's Health Initiative study it was not even interpreted correctly. That's the frustrating. So frustrating. The conclusions were not accurate at all. And <sighs> The benefits, okay, here's where it gets awesome though. Like karma never loses an address, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits of hormones have proven not only to be amazing, but not correlated with bioidentical hormones. And yes, you can get bioidentical hormones at your pharmacy. You don't have to even have them compounded if you don't want to. So mm -hmm. the benefits with bioidentical hormones is they're safe. They offset the risk of Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. Um, and the earlier you intervene, the better the results. And I mm. always am a believer in early intervention because of mm. quality of life. Like if you can prevent a woman from losing her sleep, her body composition, and, um, you know, hot flashing and losing her memory and having mental health changes, right. changes in her libido. Like you can get in early, get in early, which is why I test and don't guess. But so bioidentical mm -hmm. hormones are plant-based. They're physiologically compatible with a woman's body. And often the delivery systems bypass the gut and the liver. So you can nice. give them topically, right? Or you can give them in a dissolvable lozenge that's absorbed through the oral mucosa and goes right across the blood brain barrier, or you can give them vaginally. So there's so many different, there's, there's also creams, um, there's sprays, there's so many different ways you can give mm. bioidenticals and you can titrate the dose much easier too. It's not a mm. one size fits all. Yeah. Speaking of that, like you talk about early intervention, every, I find every professional has a little bit of different opinion on, you know, when things are low or, and of course, every individual is different. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you manage that in terms of like someone in her, maybe her mid to late forties, she's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, things are starting to get a little weird. I'm feeling different. My period's a little off. Like, 
what levels are you looking for in these, you know, major female sex hormones that, you know, you decide to start intervening? Yeah. Well, I look at the Dutch test really. Um, that's a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. And so it's going to tell you, you know, your hormone production, it's going to tell you your levels. It looks at the ratios of estrogens to each other. Mm -hmm. And it also, you look at the ratios of your hormones to each other. So estrogen to progesterone to testosterone, and it looks at your methylation or detoxification pathways. Mm -hmm. If, and you can also check, you know, your AMH, your ovarian reserves. If, if someone has healthy ovarian reserves or getting regular cycles, but their PMS is getting worse, mm -hmm. often we'll start with chase tree to bring back progesterone. For example, that person may not be a candidate for hormones, but I see, I had a client this week in my practice. She is a very well-known strength coach. She's lean as all get out. And her hormones are like a postmenopausal woman because wow. she's very low in body fat and she's mm -hmm. hot flashing and vaginal dryness having all sorts of issues. And so I say, get to your doctor. Let's look at your yeah. AMH, FSH, LH. And if those are low, you know, it may be time to actually do early intervention hormone replacement, but it, it really depends on the individual. And yeah. really I partner with doctors on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can't, prescribing this, that is way outside right. my scope, but right. I can look at the tests and say, you're right. probably a candidate for, yeah, okay. and some women, um, also, you know, if they're getting their periods regularly, but their progesterone is still really low and they're later on, you know, their upper forties. So that often they're a candidate to bring in progesterone during the luteal phase of the cycle. And again, mm. that alone is transformative. You get women who are hemorrhaging each month with blood clots and exhausted and insomnia and sweating. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden you bring in progesterone to just offset that runaway estrogen. And again, your hormones are balanced. So think of hormones as a symphony, right? There are no solo right. acts when it comes to your hormones. They all work as a collaborative team. Yeah. So you do need to bring them in, you know, based on your lab results, you do need to get your hormones tested. Once you start taking them, you need to yeah. have a doctor monitoring them every three to four months. And you really need to carefully adjust and tweak. It's not an exact science. I, you know, but if you work with a practitioner and you're constantly monitoring, it makes it much easier. Yeah. I love that you say it's not an exact science. It's, it's, it's learning yourself, right. And those levels, your levels might be a little different than someone else's, but we want to watch trends. We want to watch symptoms. And I love that you're, thank you for clarifying all of that because, you know, for, especially for women, as we approach menopause, it's like, I, I have a, I don't know if you know, Amy Killen. Do you know Amy Killen? I love her. Yeah. She's great. <laughs> I don't know her personally, but I, I okay. Her yeah. Work. Yeah. She's, she lives here locally in Utah. So I know Amy and you know, she has a bioidentical hormone clinic here and she, you know, she makes the funniest social media content, but she was oh like, my God, the best. you know, when should you not, when should you stop taking bioidentical hormones when your menopause is like, when you want to decrease your long Longevity, when you want to kill your mood, when you want to kill your libido, when you want to lose muscle mass, you know? So I love your perspective. Exactly. On that. <laughs> well, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because I, people say, well, when do I stop? I have to do this forever. Yeah. You, I'm going to. Much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and my women who I see in my practice in their seventies, when they stop, they start hot flashing all over again wow. and their sleep goes wonky. And it's like, guys, nobody would ever question a dude who was on testosterone until he was 98, right? Right. But why are we questioning women? Do we want our brains to shrivel? Do I, I mean, like there was a great study I saw today. Um, and also shout out to Dr. Louise Newsom in the UK, because what she is doing for women there is phenomenal. And I believe it was her or Davina McCall of Men of Scandal. Somebody posted um, the fact that estrogen, bioidentical hormones brought in during perimenopause slash menopause maintains the gray matter of the nice. brain. Nice. Okay. So like, why are we stopping when, you know, we think about the diseases of chronic aging, look at Alzheimer's, more women than men get Alzheimer's, number one. Number two, it takes a good 20 years to show up. Well, what happens 20 years before Alzheimer's? Generally menopause, right? So mm -hmm. uh, hello, people, let's hormone it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just 
hormone up buttercup because it's and the other thing people don't realize is their micro doses we're getting we're not trying to put you on birth control pill and get you ovulating and give you yeah. the hormones of a 20 year old right <clears throat> we're trying to just give the baseline minimum amount to offset the disease so that's why i don't recommend pellets because pellets mm. jack your levels up to these insane mm. numbers and literally overnight so imagine mm. you're driving a kia and all of a sudden somebody gives you a lambo like that's what's happening to your body, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's just, you're going from zero to 2000 overnight and it's right. very aggressive. Proper bioidentical hormones are gentle. Mm -hmm. They can be frustrating for people at first because they don't, mm -hmm. you know, knock out the symptoms overnight. You have to let your tissue saturate, let them build up in your system and then you will mm. see relief. It's a long game. Yeah. I, 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 to me, you know, I, was, I know there's people out there that are like, Nope, it's not natural. I'm not doing it. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> well, that yeah. to me, it's similar to like being like, Nope, I'm going to get my arm chopped off without any anesthesia. Cause it's natural. And I'm like, okay, all right. That's up to you. <laughs> but the right. fact that we have the ability to help now. I feel like we're so lucky. I'm grateful for it. You know, very, very grateful. Um, I wanted to also, because, you know, obviously your background's in nutrition. I wanted to talk about blood sugar. Can you talk mm. about blood sugar and going through menopause? Yeah. So I always test uh, insulin and uh, glucose and look at A1C and often have women wear continuous glucose monitors when we at, at least initially start working together. And real quick, so, just for people who don't know the difference between a one HbA1c and glucose, can you? Yes. Just so hemoglobin A1c looks at your blood sugar over the course of three months. We, <laughs> I was a hospital dietitian the first few years of my career and the diabetes team would look at it because they were like, we want to know if patients are compliant with their meds, mm -hmm. you know, or how mm -hmm. out of range their sugars are all the time. So mm -hmm. really gives you a good window of, mm -hmm. you know, chronic insulin resistance, but just looking at fasting insulin, the average person I see in practice, their insulin's around 19 and you really want it between three and five to give you, a, uh, you know, a, a guideline or parameters. And we have to remember a lot of doctors will tell you that that is a normal range. 19 is normal, right? Normal is not optimal. What normal right. is in this country is Homer Simpson is our prototype for normal, which is yeah. not okay. So yeah. during perimenopause and menopause, right? Our insulin sensitivity does decline because A, we're often more sedentary. B, mm -hmm. we are, our testosterone and estrogen and progesterone are dropping. Um, C, we have insomnia due to lower hormones and two weeks of poor sleep can cause insulin resistance. I mean, yeah. that's just, um, and so also the gut microbiome changes, we mm -hmm. have fluctuations in cortisol. So there's mm -hmm. a whole wild circus going on there. So I do teach women to try to have their carbs later in the day when we are much more insulin sensitive, a kind of protein by day and carbs with dinner, with your dinner meal to the tune of a cup, a cup and a half of a complex starch with your protein mm -hmm. and veggies. So a sweet potato, some butternut mm -hmm. squash, some quinoa or legumes, if you digest them well, um, that will give you a slight bump in insulin that will tamp down your cortisol and help yeah. you sleep if you're yeah. high overnight cortisol. Um, but you know, most people don't realize like how important movement is. I mean, 10 minutes of walking, go walk your dog after a meal that lowers your blood sugar by 17%. Um, picking up weights is just as, if not more effective than taking metformin because the more muscle maps you have, the greater your insulin sensitivity. So if mm -hmm. you feel like you're rocking that menopot and, or, or you're like, oh my God, I used to be an hourglass and now I look like a Coke can or an apple shape, then we really want to dial in, play with your carbs. Mm -hmm. If you tolerate intermittent fasting, that's another great way to reset your mm -hmm. insulin receptors, but like wear a glucose monitor, see what your yeah. sugars are before you work out, after you work out, yeah. when you wake up, what, what are they like overnight? You know, that's a great way to give you so a I, way to biohack it. Yeah. yeah, I really support that. I know when I was wearing mine, what was really eye-opening to me was watching it 
go, how high my blood sugar would go during stressful moments, stuff that I thought was normal, right? Like I'm going to a lunch with people I don't know, and I'm very extroverted. So I would always think like, oh, this is just fun. I just like this, but I would watch my blood sugar. I was like, oh, okay. I guess you were nervous or whatever. Your blood sugar looks like you just ate a bunch of carbs and you didn't eat any carbs, you know? And so (laughs) that was really interesting um, to see, you know, I would go for a run and see how high my blood sugar would go from that. I was like, wow, okay. I'm dumping out a lot of glycogen into my bloodstream. It's just such an eye-opening experience. And then eating certain foods, you're like, do I have a food sensitivity to that? Cause why did it go so high? You know, and it's different for everybody. I use those with my clients too. And it's crazy to see how different everybody is in their blood sugar responses. So I love the encouragement on that as well. It is. Well, and the thing is too, there's like you, and a lot of my clients are eating super clean, watching their carbs. Like I'm talking hundred grams a day and there's mm-hmm. blood sugar still high. And it's like, mm-hmm. dude, you got to work on your stress management, yep. your cortisol, like, yep. no, you know, <laughs> it goes to show you, right. That you could take the, uh, you can do all the workouts and take the supplements and mm-hmm. eat the right foods. And if you don't manage what is coming down from the top down, that is the biggest driver. Our mental health is the biggest driver of our stress response and our cortisol and sleep and a thousand other things. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And your, your gut health. I mean, your whole vagus nerve will shut down. Yeah. It's so huge. So I appreciate that so much. That's why I I felt forced to become a mindset coach in addition to a health coach. Cause I'm like, I can't help you. I can't, if you keep on stressing about everybody hates me and I'm failing in life, like we're not going to be able to get where you want to go. So I love that. I love that point. Okay. Let's talk about like your, um, your book, uh, cave, cave women don't get fat. Um, you know, you're talking about paleo. Why, why do you what support this message about paleo type approach for women? So, uh, another thing you may notice in the perimenopause menopause phase is a lot of joint aches and pains and Mm -hmm. progesterone. People don't realize progesterone is a natural steroid, a natural anti-inflammatory. It's like got nature's cortisone, right? So we're getting a lot of joint inflammation. We're having a lot of gut inflammation and leaky gut. I like to pair, uh, pair people's diets down. I I try to be as relaxed about eating as possible, but when there's a lot of inflammation, I'm like, Mm -hmm. let's just lock it in and clean it up. So paleo diets are what our ancestors ate. We're just going back to our roots um, ancestrally and really seeing what our DNA can handle the best. Now, let me be clear. The paleo diet that I write about is a modern day paleo diet. I can't duplicate what our, (laughs) you know, what people were eating 2 million years ago. And yes, we we didn't go and have jars of honey. You had to climb a tree and fight risk getting stung by bees. If you want honey or wait for the hive to fall to the ground. So it's not, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And people still see results on it. It's a grain free dairy-free diet. So Mm -hmm. it's rich in, wow, shocking whole foods that are nutritious. So meats and veggies and um, fresh fruits, nuts and seeds, a little honey, if you tolerate it, um, and very gut-friendly starches that are, you know, root vegetables, uh, parsnips, turnips, sweet potatoes, cassava, Mm -hmm. um, all, and uh, butternut squash. And it's a really simple diet. It's a nutrient-dense diet. And people feel great on it. I mean, it's, you really just have to find the other thing I did in cave women, don't get fat was taught women to again, work with their hormones, right. Mm -hmm. And their diet, but also, um, to find their own unique carb tolerance with that. Yeah. Yeah. With that book as well. And kind of have women do like a two week detox where you're eating fruits and vegetables and protein, and then slowly add back in starches. And again, you can do this while you're wearing a glucose monitor. Start yeah. with like half a cup of starch a day. See, how's my body composition? How's my energy, my sleep, hunger, energy yeah. cravings, right? And then mm-hmm. slowly increase. And most people, again, I, I'm going to generalize here. Most people can tolerate about a, a cup to a cup and a half of cooked starch per day. That's probably the most. And the rest should really come from vegetables, fruits, um, you know, protein, 
Yeah. I love, I love that approach. And I so recommend everybody try. It's like, just focus. If you can just focus on eating real food from nature as much as you can for a while, then when you bring in the other stuff, because you're going to be a human and you're going to have cake or you're going to have pizza, you're going to have these things. You'll notice more, you know, back when I used to be unhealthy, very standard American diet, McDonald's, (laughs) Wendy's, Taco Bell, (laughs) Kraft macaroni and cheese, even I'm seriously as an adult. Okay. Like eating all my kids food. (laughs) And, you know, when I went through my big health transition, like back then I didn't, I, there was no correlation going on at all. I was your typical standard American diet person. Like I, no, I mean, I just never even thought about it, honestly, never even thought about it. And then now I eat very pretty much the way you just described, right? Yeah. Like I will yeah. be having a purple sweet potato and eggs for lunch after this. Cause I'm on a kick with that right now. And I love it, yeah. but like now, like I, I shared on a f- previous episode, but I was out in California. I'd hardly eaten the day before it was the day before my period. So I was like the hungriest woman that has ever existed on planet earth. <laughs> and I went to air with my friend and air And I don't know if you've been to air out in California, but it's like amazing. And so I was like, yep, I'm getting two pieces of pizza. I'm getting that carrot cake. Okay. So I was like, no, no qualms about it. I had no, I was just like, yep. Eating all this. Like, yay. You know? The next day I woke up and my legs just ached so bad, just so like, and I hadn't even worked out while I was out there. So I was like, why are my lit? Oh, gluten mania. Got it. And I don't even consider myself like a super gluten sensitive person. I don't get bloating or any sort of gut issue. So that was eye opening for me. I was like, you got like a hundred times the gluten than you're used to. And look at that, like your legs freaking hurt. Like my feet hurt, everything hurt, you know? So Mm. really encourage women and everyone, but you know, especially women when, especially as we're getting older and we're more prone to inflammation, go through a phase of what you just described. And then you'll notice more when you bring those things back in, like how they're impacting you. So I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, uh, you may just also lose weight, lose all your joint aches, lose all your inflammation, feel more yeah. energized, sleep yeah. better, be happy, you know, be happy. Be yeah. um, and just to me, you know, energy is like the greatest currency. I don't eat to yeah. lose weight at all. I eat right. for energy and like building muscle. And that's kind of my greatest uh, yeah. transition in life it has yes. been for a long time. And, you know, just, yeah. Once that's your why is yeah. like, I want to feel good. And I want, I want w- what's best for me. I want, I want it all. I want to feel good. I want to have muscle. I want to have longevity. It becomes so much easier to eat healthy. It's not, you're not eating healthy for some extrinsic reason or how you look or you should it's no, I want to, cause I want that for me, you know, and it's such a beautiful place to be. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to hit on, you have a live event coming up. Can you talk about that? I'm going, we'll try to make sure this comes out before so people can take advantage of that. Yeah. So I'm going to do a live virtual event on Saturday, February 25th on mastering menopause. And we're going to spend a day together with a group of badass women who are really ready to conquer their menopause, to have the tools they need to get started on their path and to get really educated on um, how to how to get through, how to navigate, what foods do I eat? Um, what questions do I ask my doctor? What's the science of menopause? How, you know, mm-hmm. and just really unpacking a lot of things that come up. We're going to have a panel of women who've done incredibly well through menopause. We're going to do um, some pelvic floor strengthening exercises too with my uh, strength coach, Sabrina. So, you know, it's going to be just a really nice day of self-care and you're going to have the opportunity to actually um, take that to the next level as well. I don't want to spoil anything, but that's at estherblum.com forward slash mastering hyphen menopause. Nice. Thank you. We'll link that up. And of course we'll link up. See you later ovulator, which is like the best name ever. Good job <laughs> Thank um, you. that you guys can find that on Amazon and we'll, we'll link up your other books as well. And cause you have many here and I love, you know, Hey, you can even te- check out those drinking books that she talked about that she wrote before. Cause you might as well, if you're going to be doing it, you might as well <laughs> learn some tools on how to help yourself heal. <laughs> That's right. That was, that one was each and can be gorgeous. So it was my, the whole motto for that book was your body may be a temple, but who says it can't be a nightclub. So. <laughs> hey, you know what? That is so needed. Cause for someone is like, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm 23. 
and I'm going to be drinking. So at least help me yeah. figure out how to best offset the damage. So that's I, right. yeah, yeah. That's it's like, right. we got to be real. We got to be real here. So yeah, we'll link all of those up and you guys can obviously find her about, find out more about her one-on-one coaching, um, podcasts, books, supplements, everything on estherblum.com. So B L U M Esther with an H E S T H E R blum.com. So check that out. Esther, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate the work that you're doing. It is very, very needed. And hopefully anybody this resonated with, will check out your live event on the 25th of February. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for having me.